So now I'm delighted to pass you over to Guillaume Ballet, who will begin his presentation. Here you are again. Uh, yeah, so I want to talk about Turbo Iwasm, uh, so that's a working name. Uh, it's actually a reference to Turbo Geth, if some, uh, some of you have heard of it. It's, uh, it's a project by, by, uh, by Alexei to, to work on, uh, to improve the, the, the speed of Geth, and uh, we, we want to uh, leverage Iwasm. Uh, so it's a colleague and I uh, from the Iwasm team, uh, Paul, Paul Korzenski. Uh, we are working on uh, on uh, leveraging Iwasm to, to try to, to make uh, get a bit, uh, or at least the, the Ethereum 1.0 client uh, a bit faster. Um, so as a quick reminder, what is Iwasm? Uh, so maybe we should start with what is WebAssembly, what is Wasm? Uh, it's a binary format that uh, you can uh, run in your browser. So you can write a program in whatever language you want, compile it to, to the Wasm uh, format, and then uh, your browser should be able to, to run it. So now it's not only used, uh, even if it's the initial intent, it's not only used as a binary format for the browser. You have a lot of, um, of other application, you have applications. You have people uh, running it uh, you know, in uh, what's, what's called Ring Zero, in, in a, like for embedded application. So that used to be done in the 90s with a, with a JVM, and now people do it with the, with the WASM uh, EM. Um, and uh, yes, you also have uh, blockchain projects that, that use it, for example, uh, uh, EOS, and uh, of course, uh, Parity uses it for, uh, uh, actually, is it for, uh, is it for a Polkadot, or is it for a Substrate, or both? Both. Both? Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so how does uh, eWASM compare to WASM? Well, it's basically was uh, regular WASM, except that you import functions that would initially, uh, up until now, correspond to specific instruction in the, in the EVM. So functions like uh, get the Coinbase, get, uh, get the, the code of the caller, get uh, things like that. That used to be instructions, now they, they are just function calls, so you just import them. Um, so how is WASM going to be deployed in Ethereum? Well, uh, you might have heard of Ethereum 1.x, which uh, has been discussed for the last month and a half. So it's basically um, like improvements to Ethereum 1.0 uh, to make it more scalable, waiting for Ethereum 2.0, which is now a nickname Ser Serenity. Uh, so until Serenity arrives, we, we still need to, to make uh, 1.0 scalable. Um, so that's... Uh, that's uh, what we're working on at the moment, and uh, it has been decided in, in Prague during that con that, uh, well, I, it's actually been proposed, uh, it will be decided next year, um, but we're going to use WASM as uh, the language for pre-compiles. So pre-compiles are special contracts that are called often, and uh, they are going to be uh, uh, written like it, uh, they are going to be uh, rewritten in, in Wasm. They are going to run Wasm, and if you want to extend it, you can write the contract once and for all, and you don't have to re-implement them every time you have a new client. And um, in uh, when it comes to Ethereum 2.0, um, Wasm is uh, the prime candidate to be the execution engine for each shard. But uh, that's uh, that's further down the road, so there's no there's no promise of that yet. And uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, talking on behalf, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm part, at least, I'm part of the, the uh, eWASM team, but just because uh, we're working on eWASM doesn't mean EVM uh, is going to disappear, like the old EVM is going to disappear. It's still, go, it's still going to stay, first because we, we have all those contracts that need to, uh, to remain, and uh, as, like I'll explain in a couple of minutes, uh, WASM is still um, in work in progress, so uh, there's a lot of uh, reasons to keep investing in solidity in, uh, in EVM and all this, uh, all this uh, environment. So yeah, I was saying uh, EVM um, is going to stay. There are some trade-offs. Like when you compare to the current state, uh, there are different. Uh, there are some challenges. Maybe some trade-offs to you have to to uh, like overcome. Uh, first is. The binary size, because uh, Solidity compiles some code, uh, it's very streamlined, you start executing it, there's no real transformation, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple, it's pretty uh, bare metal. Um, when it comes to, uh, EVM, to EWASM or WASM, 
you can take whatever language and those languages they don't know like those compilers they don't know you're targeting uh, any uh, specific like a blockchain environment so they will produce um, like a binary that has something called the runtime so there will be a lot of craft that is uh, basically here to uh, prepare for anything that can uh, that can happen and um, and yeah all that craft st uh, takes a lot of space um, some languages uh, fare better than others clearly C is the best uh, Rust is uh, slightly better uh, slightly worse and uh, and Go is absolutely horrible because you've got the uh, the, the garbage collector, so yeah. Um, I mean, each language has its specificities, but some of them are adapted to this specific application or not. Uh, yeah, like I was saying, the spec, uh, the WASM spec is still evolving, so we're not, uh, um, I mean, we're, it's going to remain more or less the, what it looks like right now, but we could have some surprises. So when it comes to making sure that every single client does the exact same thing, that's a bit of a challenge. And uh, yes, the, the biggest uh, trade-off when it comes to WASM is that, like I was saying, uh, you have uh, an EVM binary, you start at the first instruction, and you, you execute it all the way until you stop. Um, in WASM, you require a little bit more work, actually a lot more work. You need to, uh, to transform, you need to validate. Uh, you need to validate the binary. It's not, uh, yes, like you have to go through the entire program, check everything is fine, all the loops, uh, are properly completed and things like that. So uh, it's been designed for an application that, that has uh, that would last like that would run a long time. So think Gmail. You have Gmail in your browser. Could be written in Wasm. Uh, clearly, you're going to spend like 10 seconds waiting for Gmail to load. But once it's done, it's going to remain. It's going to be running for for hours and hours at a time. Uh, in the case of smart contract, uh, the load uh, overhead is a bit of a problem because the smart contract executes and then you have to load another module which, is a, which corresponds to another contract. So um, it's, not as, uh, it's not as easy, uh, or at least it's not as uh, uh, simple and it's not as fast. Um, so that's one of the, the trade-offs we, we have to deal with. So uh, until now I try to, uh, to describe precompiles as libraries, so it would be some contract that you call. Um, and uh, yes, like you, you could optimize it this way. Um, in Wasm 2, you load it once and for all. The, the module is there, and you keep calling it again and again. Uh, but at this point, it starts looking more like a service. And that's really what the, the core of this proposal is about. Uh, th start thinking about precompiles more like a service than a library. Uh, so we keep them permanently running. And because in regular operating system, which is where Paul and I, which, uh, the, the world that Paul and I come from, uh, in operating systems, services tend to have better access rights. So we want to explore the idea of giving those services um, a bit more uh, control over the client, what the client does than, uh, than uh, regular contracts do. So we would like to give them access to the, the transaction pool to be able to um, map memory. Um, and yes, uh, that's uh, what I'm going to talk about. So there are three main domains uh, where we could uh, actually uh, improve or at least offer something or experiment at least. Uh, scalability, of course, because that's, uh, that's kind of the thing uh, Iwasm is here for. Um, storage. Storage is, uh, if, I mean, whoever has implemented a client knows that storage is a, is a problem. If anybody has done a, a full sync, uh, which is what I'm doing right now uh, at home, it's, it's taken three weeks and uh, I'm not even halfway done. Um, sorry? Yeah, parity, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to the parity office on, uh, on Monday, so I'm not saying anything. <laughs> um, and yes, consensus, so that's the, the one that is a bit more uh, uh, science fiction-y. I don't know how to present that, but uh, I just want to throw a couple ideas. Uh, and uh, yes. So let's start with scalability. Um, so I just want a, a quick reminder about parallel execution. Um, so right now, you need uh, in uh, when you receive a block, you have transactions, and all those all the all sorry all of those transactions get executed before the mining starts. And it's very important that it's sequential. I'm going to explain why. What we would like to have is something where uh, yeah. So what I meant, uh, if you look at the second CPU, it's idling until the mining starts. So it's kind of wasted. 
it's not a lot of time because clearly mining dwarfs everything else. But uh, because you have uh, things like uh, uncle rates that uh, that go up from time to time, uh, getting the to the getting being the first to the block is is quite uh, interesting. Uh, so what we would like to do is uh, the second case, which is to have uh, all the transactions spread between the, the two CPUs, and uh, and be able to uh, to yeah to get to the mining uh, faster. And that's all the more important because when you're actually syncing. Uh, with, uh, with the network, the mining is gone, so uh, the transaction is uh, everything that's uh, preventing you from, uh, from being up to date. Uh, so why can't you really have uh, um, transactions that are, ooh, okay, interesting. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, so, but at least the, the picture is still here, so that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, to try to explain why par parallelism is a bit difficult, I, uh, I propose three transactions. So those uh, squares on the left are uh, represent the state, and when you apply the transaction, uh, each transaction um, apply like touches uh, of writes or reads from squares. So the transaction one will be represented by uh, reads of writes to the red square, the two to green square, and so on. And now, uh, yes, next uh, next slide still uh, still exists. Uh, so you can see, for example, if you perform transaction three before transaction two, you get a different result than if you get transaction two first and tra tra transaction three afterwards. In the case of transaction three and transaction one, it's not a problem because they don't actually write to the same uh, to the same area. But um, yeah, you see the problem. So uh, what needs to happen is that the, the exact order of the transaction needs to be uh, reproducible. reproducible. Because if you don't, um, you just dump all the transactions in your block. Someone syncs the block, uh, execute the transactions like in parallel again, but with a different number of uh, of CPUs or something like that. And uh, it turns out the the order is inver is inverted, and therefore you have no um, you have no consensus and you have a fork. Um, so yeah, like there's uh, the difficulty in partitioning is really determining which uh, which non-conflicting uh, transactions can be run uh, together or concurrently. Uh, if two transactions touch the same area, it's better if they're uh, run uh, together like sequentially. And if they don't touch the same area at all, you can separate them uh, and run them uh, uh, in parallel. Um, yeah, so one idea uh, is that uh, partitioning is really a generalization of sharding. So if you look at sharding like a, a big global state, um, you, you want to be able to run on each shard a, um, like a parallel process, or you want to be able to do what we want to generalize it to, is inside this uh, single shard to be able to create partitions and, and write to those, uh, to those separated partitions. Um, so there's an EIP that already exists, it's called 648, and it's been created by, uh, by Vitalik. And the idea is that uh, it requires a little tweak to the current uh, model, where each transaction has to declare uh, upfront or beforehand which, uh, which addresses it's going to touch. So in the first uh, case, you have a transaction pool on the left, and each transaction says I'm going to address um, those, uh, those, those addresses. And, um, if, uh, for example, the number one and number two overlap, so the scheduler, the transaction scheduler will say, well, clearly those overlap, so I'm going to put them, they should be executed sequentially by CPU one, and uh, three and four, they overlap too, so they're going to be executed sequentially uh, by CPU two. And then once it, it's done, you just wait for completion, and then you, you start mining. Um, what, uh, what one of the things uh, Paul and I are working on is live partitioning. So the idea is to do more or less the same thing, but without actually changing the, the interface. So uh, the idea is simply you uh, you run the you, you run everything in par parallel as if uh, it was always possible. And uh, if you detect that there's a conflict, you drop uh, the second transaction, the second writer. And you put it uh, after or in a different block. Um, yeah. Um, so the way that would happen, uh, so you have two CPUs, two transactions running on two different CPUs, and you have the global state uh, at the at the far right. 
Uh, so transaction one is writing in two locations, transaction two in one location. And then in the next uh, step, transaction two tries to write in a second location, but it's a location that has already been uh, written to by, uh, by transaction one. So what we do, we simply idle. And it feels a bit wasteful, but what you have to realize is that uh, if you compare it to, um, to the current state, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be using CPU, uh, CPU2 anyway. So it's like you're trying to, to cut the line. If you don't get caught, good. If you get caught, well, too bad, but uh, you don't go to jail for cutting the line, so that's fine. Uh, another execution model that we're looking into is the classic MapReduce. Uh, so a lot of people, I assume, are familiar with this uh, because of Hadoop. Um, so the idea is to go even deeper inside the, inside the state and realize that not all uh, transactions address the same state, the same uh, area of state, sorry. And that means that you could technically run several transactions in parallel, at, uh, calling the same contract, but not touching, uh, touching the same area. Um, and um, yeah, you would need some special kind of service uh, for scheduling that we'll get back to. So I just, uh, this is a fantasy code, of course, but <clears throat> the idea is that, um, yeah, you have uh, an array that contains all your tokens, so this is some kind of ERC20 uh, token. Um, you have a first function that, uh, that tells that the, the scheduling contract will, uh, or the scheduling service would call to see, uh, to tell you, you, I have two transactions, are they conflicting? So you just check, so this is a very simple example, you just check that the to and from are all different, and if they are different, um, you just return uh, true, so that means, okay, the, the scheduling service knows that it's possible to, uh, to schedule them together. And then it will select to, uh, to uh, like, it, it will call, for each transaction, it will call the mapper function on a different CPU. So, uh, but because those transactions are not conflicting, it's, uh, it's safe. Um, so, on, um, on a more functional, uh, uh, yeah, presentation, it's, uh, you have uh, four CPUs and four transactions, but uh, what, two of those transactions write to the same location, so at most three transactions can be, lo uh, can be loaded or executed at the same time. Um, you assign three CPUs to it, the fourth is, is idling or doing regular contract management, and the third, the third transaction is pushed back to another block or, or later, down, uh, later down the list. Um, yeah, so that was it for uh, for execution, for scalability, uh, e execution scalability. Now, um, I want to talk about storage a bit. <clears throat> so, um, yes, the, the first technique that is used a lot in operating systems is caching. So you just cache uh, a bit of the state. So right now, uh, I was talking about Ethereum 1.x or 1.5 uh, before. Um, there's a proposal still by Alexi, the, the turbo, the turbo <coughs> guest uh, guy. Who, um, who just uh, proposed like to, to have some linear space, so apparently it's not making it uh, to the final draft, but this is still an interesting idea, I, I find. So <clears throat> map uh, some areas of the, of the space uh, in, uh, linearly and cache it. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Geth is uh, spending a lot of time waiting for I.O., so what we want is reduce that. Uh, we just want to keep that in memory and only write so often. So uh, spend, yeah, spend less time uh, just waiting for the disk to, to respawn. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, uh, so once you do that, you can actually do, so that was the, the state, the memory. Uh, we, you, we can do that for the code as well. So I have a bit of a, an overcomplicated diagram to, to explain that. But you still have the transaction pool here, and you have a cache of contracts. And you can see that tra transaction one, for example, and trans transaction three, all correspond to the same address, so they want to call the same contract, and it's been cached. So the scheduler is going to say, okay, they clearly access the same contract, let's put them in serial, in, uh, in, uh, in sequence, on the first CPU. And then we see that transaction two also corresponds to a, to a cached contract, so we're going to ask CPU two to, uh, to execute it first, because right now the cache is still containing the contract, so we should benefit from that. And then transaction three, uh, transaction four, sorry, is uh, is uh, not like its contract is not in the cache, so you execute it afterwards. You're going to have to load it from disk. Um, it's uh, it's a bit of a pain. Uh, one thing you can do, however, uh, that's uh, that's a diagram that has been used at, at DEFCON. 
um, is while you're loading that first uh, that that contract, you can actually uh, while you're waiting for the disk to to uh, to load, the the thread is running on will just block and give the give way to another thread, so more work can be done. So yeah, that's uh, that's roughly um, what uh, what we're working on, and now. I just uh, want to, um, like I was saying, a bit uh, something that is a bit more science fiction, but I think it's a it's a pretty exciting idea, so I'm talking about it anyway. Um, and it's to give uh, to those services, to those contracts, part of the consensus. Um, and the idea is that I was talking about the the model, like the the map reduce execution model before. I was talking about uh, the, the the other that I didn't give a name to, but uh, let's call it the the commutative uh, transaction model, I don't know. Um, and uh, those things could depend on the type of traffic. If you are at a time where you have a lot of uh, uh, CryptoKitty-like or an ICO, a uh, lot of transactions looking the same, uh, you don't want to use the same, um, the same service as if you're uh, mm -hmm. executing uh, a regular, uh, regular contract that just, uh, yeah, an, an ERC-20 token, for example. Um, so it would be interesting to actually be able to send a transaction to some service to explicitly address that service and the service will schedule those transactions for you and from then uh, some miners can decide to run some service or not um, and uh, that's pretty okay because actually uh, in Ethereum you can still ha have uncle blocks so you can have several uh, uh, blocks that uh, were all generated using a different uh, execution model. And uh, of course, the only thing that matters is that if your contract is not available or if the, the miner doesn't want to run that contract, um, you should always be able to fall back to, to the standard uh, execution model. And uh, now I, I start using the big words, um, governance. It's, um, yeah, so there's always a debate. Governance is a big debate. So wh why I find this idea interesting in spite of being a bit uh, a bit undefined still <clears throat> is that you uh, don't have to really vote if you want like to have a fork to agree with everybody you can just deploy your own service if people if for example if miners don't agree with your uh, with your service uh, with what your contract does or what your service does well they just won't run it they will refuse your transaction so you can go to a different uh, to a different miner to propose that uh, that transaction and the only thing that matters with uh, that model is that even if you refuse to uh, access, to run uh, a given contract, if you hand the block that does uh, use it, like there's a transaction that did use it, you need to be able to, uh, to execute it. So the hope is that it will result in less forks, or at least reduce the need for forks. Uh, but yeah, that's still uh, up for debate, and uh, I'm really interested in discussing that with, with uh, people. Um, yeah, so as a conclusion, um, yeah, like the reason why we offer that, uh, we want to work on that is because we believe they are advantage for, for miners, uh, simply because they get to generating the, uh, gener generating the block faster. And uh, hopefully that also translates to uh, an advantage for the user, because if it costs less to generate a block, uh, hopefully the gas costs are going to also uh, be reduced. And uh, ultimately, when you send a transaction, you wait less time, which, uh, which is always the, the goal. And on this, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. And if you have any questions. You're answering questions here, right? Yes. Do we have uh, some questions? It's way too technical for me, but uh, I'm sure we'll have someone. Thank you, Leo. So the, the second part is like the storage. Right. Um, so those like ideas and algorithms, they look kind of like generic in the sense of they could be implemented by any client. What's the, is there any relation to you wasn't? Right. So, um, Indeed, like some of those ideas are uh, already implemented in Geth. For example, there's some caching. Uh, in fact, Peter currently is doing a lot of work on that. Um, actually, is it Peter or Felix? I don't remember. But one of the two is doing something on that. Um, so why uh, why is it uh, re uh, related? It's not so. Uh, I mean, the reason why it's uh, it doesn't have to be Wasm. Um, the thing is, 
I was uh, just mentioning that because the caching could be used as an indicator of what transaction should be uh, scheduled next. So this is just connected to that idea, but clearly caching is not a novel idea, and uh, yes, it's already in use, and, uh, obviously, in, uh, in current lines. Someone else? Did you measure how much of the current traffic could be paralyzed? Yes, um, yes and no. In the sense that yes, I started measuring, uh, but for that I need my uh, my node to sync the entire blockchain, and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I didn't reach. Uh, I, I have some uh, pre uh, some pre um, uh, diagrams at home, but they just uh, where where I, I am at at the moment is right after uh, the DAO hack, so you have a lot of conflicts going on. <laughs> Uh, people are calling the same contract over and over, um, so it's not uh, giving me an, over, an overview. But yes, I, I'm looking into that, and I will. Uh, I intend to publish that uh, hopefully before the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yeah, know, this this thing takes a lot of time. I mean, uh, I might not have the best computer either, the best network connection, and so on. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's been it's taken me three weeks so far. And, uh, yeah. Have you, about, have you thought about using your sneaker network and just uh, walking to someone with a suit note? Yes, I, I have thought of that, um, except uh, no one, because uh, some people do that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a 800 dollars a month <laughs> cost. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I asked a couple of people, but they were not really uh, happy to have me run uh, scripts that take forever on their, uh, on their, on their machines. But if you have a node that has already synced, please talk to me. I would love to. Uh... Yes, you do. Yes, except all my code is for guests. But, <laughs> but I'll be talking to you uh, soon. <laughs> do we have some more questions? Okay. So I would say thank you very much, Jungs. Thanks for your presentation.